Hey everyone, I'm back again, Julian Philosophy here, and I just wanted to uh, update you on a little bit of what I've been doing since then, since we've pretty much been on a hiatus in a long time. Uh, I've been reading this book again, uh, Reflections on the French Revolution. Reflections on the Revolution in France, Edmund Burke, and it's one of the most quintessential books of uh, political conservative thinking from the early 17 to 1800s. And it was a really influential book for me. I actually really enjoyed this book the first time I read it. And I actually read it around uh, 2019, 2020, uh, during all of this, uh, the original problems that we were having, politically speaking, uh, protests, uh, viruses, etc. And uh, this actually came to me during all of the political unrest at the beginning with the police and the protesters. So it really came uh, to the forefront of my imagination. And, you know, since I'm this book's really deteriorated because of how much reading I've done to it, and I, I really appreciated it more the second time. I think I get more out of it the second time because the first time you're really experiencing for, experiencing these ideas and experiencing the character, but I feel that sometimes after the second time, I've done more research on the character, the historical circumstances, on the context in which this person exists, and it gives you a little bit more insight into, you know, beyond just the context of what the person wrote, but in what context did that person write it? What were their personal motivations? What was their idea of how they wanted this conflict to end? And I think that Edmund Burke himself was um, easily could have been like a Nostradamus type figure for predicting in terms of his accuracy. He really did give us a, a bird's eye view and a contemporary perspective on the French Revolution as the National Assembly was planning to behead thousands of Parisians and victimize so many people in the, in the, for the cause of their revolution, I felt that Edmund Burke did an amazing job revealing the moral bankruptcy of the French Revolution. And I think he said it so well in this quote, which is just on the back here, I just want to read it to you. This is uh, from Edmund Burke. To make a revolution is to subvert the ancient state of our country, and no common reasons are called or to justify so violent a proceeding. Edmund Burke's seminal work was written during the early months of the French Revolution and depicted with uncanny accuracy many of its worst excesses, including the reign of terror, a scathing attack on the French Revolution's attitude to existing institutions, property rights, and, and religion. It makes a cogent case for upholding inherited rights and established customs, argues for a piecemeal reform rather than a revolutionary change, and deplores the influence Burke feared the revolution might have on Britain. Reflections on the French Revolution in France is now widely regarded as a classic statement of conservative political thought, as one of the 18th century's great works of political rhetoric. Now, I want to give him a lot of credit for predicting what was going to happen, and I just want to give a little bit more context on him so that uh, we can really understand how, how he came to be in the position that he was and why he supported certain things. Like, for example, he was sympathetic towards the American colonists who were anti-taxation and were seeking independence, but he did not, uh, he didn't have sympathy for the violent revolutions, revolutionaries, but he had sympathy for the Americans who were being taxed unfairly and treated unfairly by the British establishment. And he felt that liberty and principles were more important than party. And I, and I agree. And that is why being politically independent, I feel right now for me is at least the best choice at the time. And I think that, uh, to give a little more context, uh, Burke was an Irishman. He was born in 1929, uh, till 19, and lived till 17, 1729 till 1797. He was an Irish statesman, economist, and philosopher. Born in Dublin, Burke served as a member of Parliament and MP between 1766 and 1794 in the House of Commons of Great Britain with the Whig Party after moving to London in the seven, in 1750. Burke was a prominent and was a proponent of underpinning virtues with man with manners in society and of the importance of religious institutions for the moral stability and the good of the state. These views were expressed in his a vindication of natural society. He criticized the actions of the British government toward the American colonies, including its taxation policies. Burke also purported the rights of the colonists to resist metropolitan authority, although he opposed the attempt to achieve independence. He is remembered for his support for Catholic emancipation the impeachment of Warren Hastings for the East, from the East India Company and his staunch opposition to the French Revolution. So, 
that can just give you a little bit more context. So he himself was not an Englishman, but he valued the stability and the peace that the British state brought to the British people in comparison to just across the channel, the absolute state of destitution and madness that was descending onto the French people due to their revolutionary ideology. And I think that as a Canadian right now, it really hits home for me. And it really hit home for me even back then during the summer of 2019, during the initial protests, was that I really personally felt like as a Canadian, as a British citizen, as well as a Canadian citizen, that we were kind of watching the Americans commit some kind of civilizational suicide the same way that we that the Edmund Burke witnessed the, uh, the, the French commit a civilizational suicide, a destruction of their own institutions, of their own culture, and, and, and at and a cost of what? At a cost of how many human beings, how much suffering? Did they really improve the state of the French people? And how much was lost? And I think that in, in the process, and I think that he makes a great point, even before the terror actually happened, he uh, immediately predicted it. He looked at the National Assembly, he looked at their incompetence at their greed and how they were the professional class that had usurped the royals the elites the religious class etc and and usurped their their established elite positions with their positions so these were doctors lawyers etc businessmen merchants essentially who took over murdered the king murdered his subjects and the religious people oppressed them and essentially i don't think one of my favorite quotes about this was uh, i don't know i don't remember who said it on it was that the French murdered their king and replaced him with a banker. And I think Macron is the perfect example of that. He wears a suit. He dresses like a banker. He doesn't have the majesty, the, the allure, the mystique of a king, a leader, a ruler. He looks like someone who's behind the desk at a bank. And that's because that's who he is. Not only was he a socialist, but he is also a member of, he was a World Bank, World Bank uh, dude and one of these people who's been groomed for this position from an early age. So I think the idea that, that we are witnessing history. Uh, we are witnessing history um, repeat itself on a huge scale right now in America. And I think it's interesting that some of the same. I noticed some comparisons the second time after reading it the second time because now we're dealing with a whole different level of state uh, uh, mandated tyranny that we're a medical tyranny that we're dealing with now. And it a lot of the mandates, the rules, the usurpations, the corruption, and the politics of the time of the French Revolution remind me of the way that. The, uh, the French were succumbing to the, revolution, the revolutionary violence, and the British were fearing it and trying to secure themselves against it. And the Canadians, us, we are witnessing the Americans uh, perform a similar act, a destructive, self-destructive, shoot yourself in the foot kind of action. And these people have, you know, th this, this awful politics from America is seeping into every country on the planet, including my country. And even the French have recently said that they actually fear this woke, uh, uh, not even liberal, anti-liberal, woke, left-wing authoritarianism that is seeping out of academia and governments and bureaucracies and companies in the United States. And it's poisoning even the French, it's poisoning Canada, it's poisoning the UK, it's poisoning every country in the world that America touches. And I think that, unfortunately, this ideology was not common to the colonies, unfortunately, until it was exported to them from the French. So this this idea that the American experience is somehow unique or different, I, 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 some level it is, but on other levels, you can see a direct comparison between the experience of the French people under the Great Terror and American citizens today under the tyranny of their own government. And I think that's hilarious that, you know, as as a uh, personally, I, I have libertarian sympathies myself, but I'm also a loyal British citizen and a British subject, and I consider myself a loyal subject of the Queen, and I, just as Edmund Burke did back in the day, and I, I take very seriously about that. That's not a joke. I'm not being I'm not being facetious. I'm not being sarcastic. I genuinely believe that, and that's what my grandparents taught me, and that's what I will be. Unfortunately, for some people, a red coat until the day that I die. That's just who I am. That's just how I've come to be. This is how I've come to relate to myself in the world. And I am a British citizen, so you can't really get mad at me for being what I am and acknowledging that my history. And and I genuinely believe that the Brit that the, the French, in an attempt to subvert the British, exported revolution and revolutionary ideology to the Americans in order to subvert them. And it and it did work. It worked amazingly. Right. 
for the French, in, except that they that Napoleon lost the war. So if only Napoleon and the French had been better on the battlefield than they were in politics, perhaps they would have prevailed and not uh, been crushed under the weight of their own hypocrisy and, and, uh, and, and, and rhetoric. And I think that the truth is that Edmund Burke witnessed all this stuff. And I, I don't want to say that I feel like a contemporary of the time of revolution, because I don't think that I deserve the credit to be able to say this stuff. I'm sure there's many other people that have, that have come to this conclusion as well. But to me, it appears that uh, at the end of the day, for the French Revolution and the characteristics that uh, that Edmund Burke described are almost exactly to the T, exactly what's happening in America and in almost every woke, anti-liberal, anti-West uh, place in the United States and Canada and everything in the Anglosphere and and beyond. So uh, just to, just to give you a little bit of a of an example of some things that I learned from the book. Uh, first, the the, uh, the soldiers were a main part of, of this political French upheaval and political evolution. That if the soldiers had not uh, sided with the people, had they sided with the government, the French Revolution would never have taken place. The storming of the palace, the storming of the Bastille, may not have taken place. And I think that at this point right now, uh, it seems to me that. The, the, the Americans are experiencing a uh, existential crisis in themselves and that they are the, the old Americana, the classic American ideology, uh, which I seem to think is actually far more libertarian than the ideology, the sort of revolutionary ideology that the French exported to them and kind of used them in a real way. If you really think about it, the French don't care about the Americans. They still don't care about the Americans. They never cared about them in the first place. The only reason they supported them was to undermine the British. So it's kind of ironic that the French are now complaining about the fact that the American hyper-revolutionary violent rhetoric is damaging the, the fabric of democracy globally. It's like, well, who who created this this uh, rabble of anti-democratic violent re revolutionary rhetoric and who exported it all around the world, really? So if you really want to blame someone for, for the state that we're in right now, I would say that personally as a British citizen, I would say that, and a Canadian citizen, that... I am watching the descent into madness, and I've been watching it, and it's happening to people all around me, and it's insane. And uh, petty tyrants, as, as Tim Pool said recently, that the, this, this, uh, the propaganda and the, and the fear mongering and, and, and everything is turning everyone into a petty tyrant. And I think that the, uh, the revolutionary, the, the hypocritical, nonsensical revolutionary rhetoric of the time period in the 1700s is very reminiscent of the nonsensical violence, often self-destructive rhetoric that Western socialist uh, uh, leftists, etc., have brought on themselves. And I include neocons in that, conservatives and all of their appeasers, and, and everyone who uh, essentially doesn't toe toe the line for the military-industrial complex, the media, you know, the corporations. Everyone's involved in this, so there isn't just unlike before where you could only blame the universities for dispersing this poisonous ideology and poisoning the well discourse, you could easily point to any number of institutions in America spreading this poisonous left-wing ideology worldwide. You know, I mean, having having pride flags and, and BLM flags at the embassy in Kabul, Afghanistan, I mean, really, like, that is an example of them doing to the Afghanistan, Afghan people against their will, most of the time, I'm assuming, not always, but against their will sometimes, Trying to convert them the way that the French used the Americans against the British, and I and I and I see this happening again, and I see that um, that Edmund Burke referred to many British people who were who were positive towards the revolution and were anti -mo anti monarchy. They didn't recognize that the monarchy in Britain, a thousand year reign of our particular monarch, is in fact. One of the reasons why Canada is not facing the same level of political and and and, and uh, just basic physical degradation and economic degradation that's happening to America, I genuinely believe the same. That the reason that the UK and Canada are not suffering uh, the way that, for example, Australia or America is, is because they, to a lo much larger degree, have rejected British common law in favor of their own rather authoritarian local version of British English common law. And I think that 
these colonial uh, uh, versions of British society, which have been colored by their own experiences, their own geography, their own history, are taking the shape of a European tyranny from the 1900s. So I would say that after witnessing everything that I've seen in the last couple of the last three years, basically, and reading this book twice, it was twice as meaningful the second time that I read it because I felt like I was living it. First time I was like, well, this is interesting. It has certain comparisons. It's from an academic level. The second time, I genuinely feel we are in the midst of many revolutions, a multifaceted cultural, economic, revol political revolution that's global and that the effects are global, that they are no longer contained to the, the, the continent of North America, the continent of Europe. These ideas have been dispensed all over the world. Uh, and, and they're doing battle in a number of different theaters all across the world, ideologically, physically, economically. And it's gonna, we're going to see what's going to happen. I mean, exporting this idea to the, these revolutionary ideas to the United States caused a giant, violent revolutionary wars that I'm sure some of the, some of the causes were, were justified. But then some of the others, you know, I, I feel that if the Americans truly believe that the British Empire was taxing them beyond all reason, and, you know, taxation without representation, the current state of the American government and their high taxation, their authoritarian gun crackdown, their authoritarian crackdown on free speech, authoritarian crackdown on anyone who isn't a far left authoritarian Chinese spy agent, essentially, like Joe Biden. I literally believe that at this point, we are in the midst of a cultural revolution that is actually far more significant than the French Revolution. Imagine the French Revolution, but times every country in the entire world. So it's instead of just witnessing it, you find some space and you're observing it like Jane Goodall from a distance, like the British did and, and Edmund Burke saying, Oh, look, look at these these French and their and their terrible political ideas. Now it's the barbarians are, are beyond the gate. The barbarians are inside the gate. The barbarians are running our politics. So I, I don't I don't believe that I believe that to a certain degree that us in Canada we have been isolated from some of the worst violence, politics, protesting, etc. Because we have this ancient connection, this ancient empire and British common law, which provides us with stability. And it's not because authoritarianism or bow to your rulers or anything like that. It's because just because of the way I was raised, maybe I'm being biased, but I want to know what any of you think as well. I genuinely believe that the authoritarianism that we experience in Canada is nothing compared to the authoritarianism that people experience in France, in America, in, in Australia, and in, in, in England and Britain are much more similar uh, uh, politically, ideologically than people would like to believe. At least the English can Canadian part of is far less authoritarian than the French part. If you look at the way that Quebec is handling the, the, the lockdowns and passports, you will see that it is very similar to the French and the Australian way of doing things. And it's, there's no resemblance to the Canadian or the, the English speaking Canadian or the American, uh, uh, American patriot uh, uh, a response to this virus, which is that you have to learn to live with it. You have to learn to live with it. You cannot fight a virus as if it is a, a force of, of enemies to be reckoned with or to reconcile with. This is a, a natural, to some degree, obviously it's been mutated and, and augmented, but it is, it is something that we need to learn to live with. We cannot shut our society down and, 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 and engage in this self-destructive you know, uh, uh, political, personal sabotage that we're engaging in. And I, I believe that that part of the, that, that uh, it's a, I remember this comment that someone said a while back, my father actually said this, I've heard it many times since then, and it reminded me recently, that there was a, there, it was in the 70s, and there was a debate of a bunch of different intellectuals uh, from different countries. And they asked, you know, the British man, the French man, the American, what, what is the effect of the French Revolution? What is the effect it's going to have? On society, and you know, they gave very complex answers, historical answers, philosophies, and answers. And they came to the Chinese guy and they asked him, you know, the Chinese academic, you know, what do you think of this? And his response after a second of contemplation was, "It's too soon to tell." And I think that that kind of long-term 
thinking, planning, expecting that the Queen and China, the Queen of England, and, and, the, the, and the Chinese in general, are capable of planning thousands of years in, into a long-term system of governance and stability. And that's what happens when you have a multi-thousand-year empire. And that's why I'm comparing it. Whereas the Americans, they will never reach a multi-thousand-year empire if they engage in civilizational suicide. So I think that the French engaged in civilizational suicide once they reached a certain point. I think that the CCP was engaged in civilizational suicide and the destruction of the ancient, much far superior Chinese culture to the current far less uh, 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 sophisticated uh, uh, humanitarian, uh, lacking in humanitarian human rights version of Chinese society that we currently have. The version of French society that we currently have is lacking human rights, is lacking freedom, and I think that these hyper-revolutionary societies, as an example, China, France, and a post-revolution, France post-revolution, and America post-revolution, all currently resemble the type of medical and authoritarian tyranny that is very similar. And you can see them all the same. And the, and, and the Australians, I don't know, they're, they're on a whole different level of authoritarian. They're closer to China, I think, geographically politically than we are, to be honest. And I think that's something we may have to reconcile with as folks that they do not believe in freedom and perhaps they never did. And um, and I think that, at least the government anyways, in most of those countries, and and I genuinely don't think that the Australians share our, uh, at least the government at least is demonstrating it does not share the British or the Canadian government's commitment to uh, certain kinds of freedoms that we have under the British common law, British English common law system that the Americans fought against. And I think that it is to their detriment because now they are suffering under the yoke of their own oppression that the Americans fought tooth and nail. They, they killed British people. They destroyed our empire. They decimated the, 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 the amount of the, the, all the work that the British did to build America up. And you know what these ungrateful colonists did? They come back, and you know what they do? They tax themselves far more in, than, the, than the British king ever could. So, you know, personally, my assessment is that the French, in an attempt to sabotage the British Empire in the 1700s, is actually responsible for the current uh, revolutionary fervor that is seeping into almost every country in the world and causing mass problems, mass uh, incompa inca incompatibility politically, uh, uh, economically, and I think that even spiritually, you can almost see that wherever you introduce this woke politics, it goes to war with religion, with whatever the religion is of the people of that area, whoever they are, be it Christians, Muslims, Jews, these woke people despise anyone who puts anything above the state, anything above their own personal political ideology. How dare you, right, as Greta Thunberg would say, how dare you dif differ from any leftist ideology, no matter who you are. You could be you could be someone in Afghanistan who doesn't want to fly a BLM flag, or you could be someone in America who just says, hey, maybe I just want to have free speech, and you will be treated as if you just violated their rights when in fact your rights are being violated and in fact being violated by your own government. So I would say that in this that I've witnessed, that I've seen, and I would encourage everyone to do the same, please read Edmund Burke, Reflections on the Revolution in France. Learn the same, learn these things, learn history, learn where we came from and understand how these ideas worked in the past and you will understand how they will fail in the future. It is literally that simple. Edmund Burke predicted it, Years before, and watching it at the contemporary time, and I will make a similar prediction to Edmund Burke that the revolutionaries will eventually sacrifice them, be sacrificed themselves on the altar of their own ideology. That, that Robespierre and the rest of the revolutionaries were eventually declared not revolutionary enough by the French Revolution and, 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 and taken apart by their own people. And I'd say that the, the left wing authoritarians and right wing authoritarians that believe in medical tyranny and anti free speech and anti democratic uh, 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 systems of doing uh, uh, governance and politics, they themselves will become like the, like the French revolutionaries. They will be like an Ouroboros 
of, of hypocrisy, eating themselves, the snake that endlessly eats itself for its own, and not in a good spiritual, uh, you know, infinite reality kind of way, but in a, these people have no capacity for self-realization. And I found it hilarious when Biden said he was a student of history. I'm not sure what history he's reading, because if he read history, he would understand that he himself is engaging in a self-destructive path that is going to damn America for the next 50 years. If anything, I don't actually see America recovering from this. I don't see this. This is the fall of America. This is progressive. This is the way that if you witnessed what happened with Edmund Burke talked about in France, he talked about how they destroyed their king. They humiliated themselves publicly in order to do this. And, and he says, did they really improve the state of the average person? Did, did, did the revolution improve the living conditions, the living quality, the, the beauty of the French countryside? Was it improved? Was the was the human rights improved of the people there? Were the were the were the surroundings, were the living situations improved? No, they weren't. The French Revolution destroyed any progress that could have been made in in the years that that he argued for small advances and small reforms on the way to bettering their society. And I think the same exact thing would be true for us. If you look at the way that our Western society, and I, and I will make a huge differentiation here. I am pro-classical Western civilization. I am anti-modern Western civilization. It's a huge difference. And you know, it didn't, it didn't take that long for this to happen. Even as soon as 2010, I, I think the world was a better place in terms of our ability to be rational with each other and polite and, and converse with each other with different ideas. But now I do not see that. I see this as every single social and political revolution that has taken place, including these medical tyrannical mandates that are being foisted upon us against our will, that nothing is improving our quality of life, no matter how much they protest, just like in the French Revolution, no matter how much they protest, no matter how many uh, 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 officials or middle class or upper class people they put to the guillotine, the conditions of the average Parisian, the average French man, woman, and child did not improve because of the destruction of that particular system. And I'm not saying, and I am not pro-French loyalty, I am not an apologist for tyranny of any sort, of any shape or kind of sort. And if the, and if the British do the same that the Australians and the French are doing, I will be on here condemning them the exact same because it is about principles and not about party. And I think that at the end of the day, we really need to take a close look at ourselves and say, how much better is your life because of these fights that are taking place? Or is your life getting measurably worse on a multitude of fronts? And I think that it's pretty obvious to anyone who is an honest, a genuine, intellectual person who is polite enough to admit when they're wrong that Every single cultural, political revolution, almost every single one that's taken place uh, in the last, I'd say, seven years, almost every single one of them has caused damage and destruction to the Western world, to innocent people, to anyone in the path of this tyrannical, often authoritarian uh, uh, hydra that comes out of nowhere and just starts you know, destroying our rights, destroying our civilization and undermining our freedoms. And to anyone that can see this in the future, and maybe I'll come back and I'll witness this and I'll say, man, I really wish that we could go back to those days where I could even tell the truth about anything. I could say anything. And I, I, I'm hoping that these kind of messages will reach someone else. And whether you agree with me or not, please, I would love it for you to read something to do with the French Revolution and tell me, am I wrong? Am I right on this? Am I reading too much into this? Am I, am I assuming that history always repeats itself? Or am I genuinely recognizing some serious historical trends? I would really like to know what you guys have to say. So as usual, uh, please, I'd like to see what you have to say and hope to see you guys later. Have a nice day.